What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees, and welcome to week 11 of my weekly CFL football pick show for the 2021 CFL football season. It is 9.30 in the morning, and I am tired. That's right, groggy voice and groggy face, Justin, is the one that you get in week 11. Such is life. Week 10 very clearly could have been better. I was still under 500, but only by a single game. I wound up 7 and 8 overall on the week, so certainly could have been better, but also certainly could have been worse. I started the week 3 and 6 through the first three games. I was 1 and 2 in each of the first three games, and I thought, oh my god, here we go again. Then all of a sudden, I swept the Montreal-Ottawa game on uh, Thanksgiving Monday, and I thought, okay, even money, even money, so close, went one and two in the last game. So, you know, it is what it is. I feel like I'm getting closer. The sweeps, I think, are coming a little more frequently. So I just, I still feel like I'm getting closer, even though the number seven and eight, I got to keep the faith. I hope you will as well. Two and three straight up in the five game week 10, only one and four against the spread. So the spreads, I wound up really struggling. But then the totals where I've struggled all year long, I went four and one on the totals. So maybe sometimes there is no really predicting how my own individual results will go. Overall on the season, 19 and 20 straight up, just 49%. 17 and 22, both against the spread and on the total. So those both have evened themselves up. 53 and 64 is just over 45%, which did increase ever so slightly from the previous week because, again, we were really close, 46.67 on week 10. It improves the numbers very slightly. CFL Fantasy, obviously it was a massive opportunity with multiple teams playing multiple games to really do some damage in CFL Fantasy, and I responded with a week that uh, isn't even the best week that I've had all season. So unfortunately, I did lose ground in CFL Fantasy, now down to 18th. That's down six spots from the previous week. Only 82.2 points in week 10. So look, I've had better weeks than that in weeks where everybody only plays one game. So it, it's, it was a bit of a disappointment from a fantasy perspective. I definitely expected more. I mean, when you had one of the running backs, I had Timothy Flanders because I'm like, oh, he's going to play two games. He only wound up playing one of the two because I believe he was injured for the Montreal game. So, you know, I guess that's the gamble that you take. My Week 10 MVP, I could have chosen Caleb Evans because he did technically have the most points on my roster. He also had the benefit of playing a second game, and he didn't totally blow things away. It was like 22-some points. I'm going to go with Nick Dembski, wide receiver for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Had five catches, 79 yards, and a touchdown for 19.3 points. Only played the one game. So, in those terms, I think on a per-game average, Nick Dembski wound up being the best player on the roster. Going to give him the MVP for week 10 and the week 11 CFL fantasy roster is right in front of your eyes right now we're gonna load up on some Winnipeg Blue Bombers they have a very exploitable matchup this week so for the first time this season I believe rolling with Zach Kolaros at quarterback and we're gonna stack him with Nick Dembski once again as well as Kelvin McKnight so we're gonna grab some Winnipeg playmakers to see if we can have ourselves a high stack we're going to roll with Kadeem Carey, had a very strong game last week, and William Stanback on the idea that he will be back this week. Uh, Cameron Artis Payne played in the backfield for Montreal last week, had himself a monster game, but I imagine William Stanback will be back this week. Also going to grab Hergi Mayala in the flex. He's got a part of that Calgary offense. I think Calgary has a somewhat exploitable matchup this week as well, so I'm going to grab Hergi Mayala on value alone. There is my roster for week 11. Let's see if we can do some damage, make up some ground. Coming off of a five game week in week 10, we've only got three games here in week 11, which means we've got three teams that have the bye this week, those being Toronto, Hamilton, and Saskatchewan. Now, most books do not have lines for these games yet, so all of our lines are coming courtesy of our friends at Bet Regal, who I believe are the official gaming partners of the CFL. We've got Winnipeg in Edmonton taking on the Elks where they've made a really interesting decision in their offensive personnel, which we will talk about. Montreal is in Ottawa to take on the Red Blacks and Calgary travels to BC to take on Michael Riley and the Lions. 
We're going to kick things off in the Week 11 preview with the most lopsided matchup of the week, and that's taking place in Edmonton. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers, 8-1, and one, winners of six games in a row, taking on the four-straight game losing Edmonton Elks, sitting now at 2-6 and six on the season. These first two games rematches from matchups last week, so these two teams played each other just last week, and Winnipeg uh, kind of put the boots to them to the tune of 30 to three. So the Bombers have now scored 30 points or more in five straight games, and they've allowed opponents to score over 10 points only once in that same span. So four out of the five games score 30 plus, allow fewer than 10. To the delight and probably relief of most Bombers fans, last week was the most Andrew Harris game that Andrew Harris has had in 2021. Harris touching the ball 25 times, 174 all-purpose yards, two rushing touchdowns. Andrew Harris is back, folks. It makes me feel really good about the prospects of maybe in the back half of this season, my Andrew Harris to win most outstanding Canadian uh, might actually pay off if he keeps playing like this. And what have I been talking about all year? I've been talking about great teams not only winning time of possession, but dominating time of possession. That was the case in this game, Winnipeg possessing the ball for over 36 and a half minutes. And Winnipeg may actually have a shot here at catching Montreal for the CFL number one overall time of possession on the season. Montreal currently sitting at an average of 32-33 for possessing the ball. Winnipeg 31-01. Wouldn't you know it, the best team in the league, far and away the best team in the league, controls the ball very well and for long periods of time. Who'd have thunk it? For the Elks, they're going to have to be getting sick of seeing the Blue Bombers on the other side. This will be their third head-to-head -head matchup in the last five weeks. And the Elks, bafflingly, are fully turning away from Trevor Harris at the quarterback position. It's like denying, deny, I'm going to deny you Trevor Harris three times. Like, they've turned away from him. He's healthy. He played last week, or at least he's, he's healthy enough to have played last week. I know he was dealing with a neck injury, but they just flat out said, no, nah, nah, we're going to go with uh, Cornelius and Prukop. What? The Elks got absolutely pounded on the ground in that game as well. They came into that game with the number two run defense in the CFL. 31 carries against 194 rushing yards and the two rush touchdowns to Andrew Harris. They got absolutely pounded on the ground. And that was like the one thing their defense could really hang their hat on was that they had a really good run defense. Oh boy, they kind of got exposed. But again, obviously, the real story here is that baffling QB1 decision. Why you would turn away. I understand the season hasn't gone the way you wanted it to. But you look at Trevor Harris... And you're like, okay, he's completing 70% of his passes. He's thrown more touchdowns than interceptions, which no other quarterback on the roster, I don't think, can say, except maybe Dakota Prukop because he's barely thrown the ball. And has a 94.3 QB efficiency, which, yes, there are better efficiencies in the league. Absolutely. You're going to look at those things, and you're going to say, no, I'm going to turn to the guy that's completed 61% of his passes, uh, thrown three touchdowns but six interceptions and has a QB efficiency that's almost 30 points lower than the guy I'm turning away from. Like, if this was what you were going to do with Trevor Harris, leave him on the six-game injured list. Somebody very aptly brought up the point in a comment section, I think, on the news article about this. Like, you could have left him on the six-game injured list and saved his money against your your, like, against your cap, I guess. Like, why would you not have just left him on the six-game injured list? Why put him on the six-game injured list, then pull him off, give him one start where he gets dominated, obviously, by the best team in the league, and then say, well, we're going to go with the other guy now? Like, talk about setting your guy up for failure. I never would have thought the Elks would have been in this position when I started this at the beginning of the season, but guess what? Cornelius is not beating Winnipeg, right? That's full stop. End of prediction. Winnipeg is winning this game and should win this game relatively comfortably. So obviously, Winnipeg over Edmonton. Both of Edmonton's wins this year have come against the West Division. So there, there is that. But Winnipeg has played the West Division six times and they've won all six games. 
On the line, the Bombers are laying 14 and a half points as a road favorite, which is a massive line that they are probably, almost certainly, in fact, going to cover. So I am going to lay the 14 and a half points. Edmonton, not only have they, I don't think they've won a game at home this year. Maybe they did early in the season. I don't think they did, though. But they have certainly have not covered against the spread at home this year. They are 0 and 4. And I just I thought Trevor Harris could cover that number last week and he couldn't. Taylor Cornelius is not going to cover this number. So it's a disgusting line to lay, but I'm gonna lay it minus 14 and a half. Total in the game set at 41 and a half points. I think this total is just too low for me to sweat the under. So I'm gonna go over on it. I don't think it flies, but I think the over hits. We're going to take Winnipeg 30, Edmonton 13. Winnipeg covers the minus 14 and a half. Game goes over by just a little bit. Can't believe you're going back to Cornelius. We will travel to Ottawa next, the Montreal Alouettes in Ottawa to take on the Red Blacks. Now, these are two teams firmly now going in opposite directions. Montreal, since I basically called them, not called them out, but basically called like, hey, your, these games are must win now. Like, I know it's only six games into the season, but you're at the point where you absolutely cannot afford to lose football games. And they've reeled off two straight wins, including the win against Ottawa uh, on Monday. It was 20 to 16. Now, they scraped by with that win. They had to get it on a last minute touchdown. And now they got to send their starting quarterback, Vernon Adams, to the six game injured list. So, the, the, the obstacles are only mounting in front of Montreal's path. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Montreal did not have the luxury of William Stanback in their backfield with that game last week. But in his place, Cameron Artis Payne goes off. Maybe a name my NFL fans might remember. 25 touches of the football, 149 all-purpose yards, and the game-winning rushing touchdown with 42 seconds left in the game. He made a statement in his first ever CFL start a lucky Whitehead-esque impact when he finally gets an opportunity in this league. He grabbed it and he ran with it. Montreal may run a dual back system. They know now they've got two talented, capable running backs. So obviously, the big news, of course, Vernon Adams going to the six-game injured list. That means it's Matthew Schiltz's team. I don't think he's got the ceiling of Vernon Adams, but... I think he's arguably got a more consistent and slightly higher floor. Like, we've seen Vernon Adams put up some absolute stinker football games. I don't think Matthew Schiltz will do that. I think his floor is slightly higher than Vernon's is. He's got the experience. He moves the football very well on his career in the CFL. He's played 40-some games in the league and 12.1 yards per completion throwing the football so he can move the ball and on this Ottawa defense you should be able to move the football I don't think the drop off is going to be that much I'll be perfectly honest he can make plays with his feet too for the two and seven Red Blacks losers of two straight games both of those games coming in week 10 it was a loss at Toronto and a loss at Montreal they lost those games by a combined score of 55 to 32. I'm not going to put the entirety of those two losses on Caleb Evans. He did put up 577 all-purpose yards in total in those two games. He did toss four picks. Not all of them were his fault, but a couple of them were just bad decisions with the football. And in a couple of cases, they wound up in his own end zone. So, you know, it, it, he definitely made some mistakes and didn't take the step forward that I expected him to take. The three interceptions against Toronto was really what ruined kind of a tight game. But again, one of them was tipped at the line of scrimmage. Uh, another one of them, I think he was under really crazy pass rush pressure. I think he might have four or five guys in his face so I can understand why it happened. Like, I'm not going to hang the whole thing on him, but that was a tight game at the half. Ottawa led that game 9-8 to eight at the half, and then Toronto put up 27 unanswered points in the third quarter, including, I think, two pick sixes. So, I mean, when that happens, you're just, you're just not going to win. And maybe I'm making too much of the fatigue factor here, but this is going to be, this game that we're talking about, the Montreal-Ottawa game, is going to be Ottawa's fifth game in 25 days. They do not get another bye week. It'll be their last bye week of the season. They don't get another bye until week 15. Like, I can't imagine, if you took an NFL team and told them, hey guys, you have to play five football games in 25 days, 
They'd squeal like pigs under a gate. I don't think anybody, I don't think any team, I don't think the best team in this league could consistently win games under that kind of scheduling, under that kind of pressure. It's crazy. And I understand there's been scheduling shenanigans. There was the missed game. I understand stuff had to be shuffled around. But like Ottawa really got the raw deal here. Five games in 25 days. Even without Vernon Adams, I still think the Alouettes are the better team here top to bottom. And again, I don't think they're going to regress all that much with Matthew Schiltz. I'm going to take Montreal here again. They're the better team. I'm going to take them to win. We're going to take the Alouettes over the Red Blacks. Every East Division game, basically for the rest of the season, same deal. It's must win for the Alouettes if they really want to hold on to that third playoff spot in the East and not have to worry as much about the crossover teams. They have to be must-win games. So Montreal's got to win. I think they're going to. On the line, the Alouettes are laying five and a half points as a road favorite here. Now, they only won the game last week by four. But remember, just a few weeks ago, they blew this team out 51-29. to I realize that was with a different quarterback situation for Ottawa, a different quarterback situation for Montreal than what they're going to be going into in this game. I'm going to lay those points, even though it seems like Kind of a big number, and they literally did not cover this number less than a week ago, like a couple of days ago. Montreal's got a ton of playmakers on the offensive side. I think Schiltz is going to have a good game. I'm going to lay the five and a half. Total in the game set at 48 points. This is a lot of points for the CFL in 2021. But I also think it's very close to what the point total is going to wind up. And even though this would have hit a very, very, very firm under... Last week, I think Caleb Evans is going to be better. I think Montreal's offense is going to be better. I'm going to take the over in this. I don't think it flies. I think it gets over on the last scoring play of the game. I'm going to take this game to go over the 48 points. Let's go Montreal 28, Ottawa 21. And before we talk about the last game of the week, I'm going to take the opportunity, as I always do, to shout out my great friends and sponsors at Nerd Tees. Folks, nerdtees.ca is the spot that you need to go to, as if you didn't already know, in order to find dozens and dozens of tremendous tea blends and accessories, all kinds of incredible things. Christmas is right there. It's right there, guys. It's almost here. And you're going to be able to use my promo code, which is BWFinest, and that is going to save you 15% at checkout with nerdtees.ca. You're also going to get free shipping in Canada on any order over 100 bucks. Or if you're one of my American viewers, you're going to get a great deal on the U.S. dollar. The conversion rate on the U.S. dollar is very good. Today's blend is Amaretto Almond Biscotti, one of the first blends I ever bought from Nerd Teas, and it smells incredible, tastes incredible, helping my sore throat from having recorded my CFL, my NFL show yesterday and my CFL show today. It's tough getting through these back-to-backs, but I do them because I love you. What else do I love? I love nerdteas.ca. Promo code BWFINEST, save your 15%, get your free shipping, find yourself something to love, or find someone you love something to love. You can do it at nerdtees.ca. All right, the final game of Week 11 takes us to BC Place. The BC Lions playing host to the Calgary Stampeders. Now, all of a sudden, two teams going in opposite directions. BC does have the benefit in this game of coming off of their bye week. Calgary, winners of two straight games after starting the season 2-5 and five and kind of looking like they were done. BC dropping two straight. They're at 4-4. Four and four. For the second straight week, Calgary beat the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, considered to be a West Division favorite, a Grey Cup contender. This time they went to Mosaic Stadium and beat them in Mosaic Stadium. Uh, that was not what I predicted that was going to happen, but Calgary looking really impressive in these two straight wins. I guess maybe do we have to question whether Saskatchewan is a Grey Cup contender at this point, but that was a season-saving statement by the Stamps over these last two weeks. Another big game for Kadeem Carey. I'm not going to say anything else other than to pat myself on the back. 25 touches, including five catches in the pass game, and that's really important. Getting him involved in the pass game makes this offense way more dangerous. 25 total touches, 178 all-purpose yards for Kadeem Carey, and a, a Kadeem Carey touch in this game was seven yards. Let him touch the ball, seven yards. Let him touch the ball again, seven yards, and it was that all game long. 
Could be possible that the Stampeders' defense, much maligned for most of this season, might be turning it around. They only allowed 260 total yards in that game last week and under 7 yards per play on both first down and and second down so they locked first down down they locked second down down and down down you know whatever sometimes we get some fun wordplay around here but they played very well on those first two downs putting saskatchewan in tough decisions tough situations and in those last two games both of those games against saskatchewan i think they only gave up 618 total yards Meanwhile, over on BC's side of the field, things not going quite as well. They got spanked by Winnipeg back in week nine by the tune of 30 to nine. One of those, again, those 30 plus uh, fewer than 10 uh, games for Winnipeg. Again, they got spanked on both sides of the ball and they've lost Lucky Whitehead for two to four weeks. He broke, uh, I think, one or two bones in his hand. He's out at least for a couple of weeks. Basically as bad as it gets for the Lions in that game last week. Zero offensive touchdowns. They allowed Zach Kalaros to throw for 417 yards passing. They had absolutely no run game because apparently they never do. They allowed Michael Riley to get sacked six times and only averaged a pretty pathetic 3.2 yards per play on first down. Imagine that. Imagine in a three-down league instead of a four-down league like the NFL, you start every drive with three yards in a cloud of dust. Then you're in second and seven, the equivalent of being like third and seven in the NFL consistently on like every set of downs. I think we are starting to see the reality of the BC Lions. They have feasted on East Division opponents this year. They're 3-0 and against teams in the East. Their average margin of victory in those games is 18 points. They feasted on the East Division. When you put them up against their division mates in the West, it's a very different story. They're 1-4 and four in those games. Their average margin of victory in those games is negative 6. So if two very Jekyll and Hyde, very different stories, depending on the team that's in front of them. Unfortunately for BC, it's a West Division opponent in front of them this week. To paraphrase Dr. Dre in the NWA song, Express Yourself, I got momentum while other suckers lack it. And unfortunately, the BC Lions are suckers in this game. They are the team that does not have the momentum. Calgary very firmly has momentum, very firmly in the process of saving their season, looking at that third maybe spot in the East, the West Division, maybe even the second spot in the West Division. But they've got the momentum. The BC Lions do not. I'm going to take Calgary in this game on the road in BC. I'm on all three road teams this week and all three favorites. That might be scary. Anyway, I got Calgary beating BC. On the line, Calgary's only favored by a half point. So obviously, I like them to win. It is literally the smallest price to pay other than a pick em, So we're going to lay the half point on Calgary. Total in the game set at 43 and a half. This is probably the most interesting total for me this week because it's an iffy under... But there's so many question marks on the Lions' offensive side. Are they actually going to choose to run the ball in this game? Without Lucky Whitehead, who else steps up in the receiving core? Like, you've got Lamar Durant, who's been on and off of the injured, uh, the practice list, like DNPs in practice, limited in practice. You've got Brian Burnham, who obviously is a nuclear weapon, but... Who else do you have after that? Is it Kotoy that steps up? Is it Durant that steps up? Who steps up for the BC Lions? So with that question mark in there, I've got to stay under on it, I think. It's going to be very, very close. This one's going to be a sweat. But I'm going to stay under 43 and a half points. I'm going to take Calgary 23, BC 20. There you go, folks. The abbreviated Week 11 picks are in. We'll go over them here with you one more time. I've got Winnipeg going to Edmonton, hanging a big loss on the Elks 30-13. Winnipeg covers minus 14.5 in a game that goes over 41.5 points. I got Montreal beating Ottawa in Ottawa by a score of 28-21, which means I'm laying the 5.5 points on the Alouettes in a game that goes over 48 points. And I've got the Calgary Stampeders in BC beating the Lions 23-20, to laying the half point on Calgary in a game that stays under 43 and a half.
The week 11 picks are now in the books, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the uh, Thanksgiving week games back in week 10. Kind of a jam-packed schedule, but I hope you got to watch as much football as humanly possible. And if you're one of my Canadian viewers, my many Canadian viewers, I hope you got to spend as much time as possible with the folks that matter the most. I know I certainly did. That's it for me. Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees. I now have to go do some laundry and get ready for work in a couple of hours. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the games in week 11. We'll see you again for week 12. And we're careening ever closer to the end of this regular season. We've only got like five weeks left. It's coming up quick.